In order to get us started on that path towards lots of drinks and good food tonight, who better than Claire Pym of the UK government comms to set us down that path? Um, Claire is leading the resilience effort of the UK government comms. We'll ask her how that's going. And talking to us about the before, during, and after of COVID-19. Claire is one of our international board members, so she knows that she is always subject to a good teasing and harassment, which she welcomes. So with that, please help me in joining and welcoming Claire Pym to the stage. Claire. I've got a glass of water, which might be slightly too optimistic, so I'm going to move that. Right, uh, thank you all for coming back from lunch. I hope you all had a lovely time. Um, and thank you for joining me here today. So I'm here to talk about the UK government's response to COVID-19 and how we harnessed the power of data during the pandemic to save lives. We used it to shape what we did on a daily basis and also how we're building on that legacy and how we respond to new crisis. So I know we're all enjoying uh, being in 2022 and being together, but I'd like to cast your mind back to January 2020. The UK news was all about Brexit and Meghan and Harry quitting the royal family, and there was a disease in China. But very quickly, by March, the very beginning of March, it was clear that this was a problem on a scale we had never imagined. People were dying across the world from a disease we knew so little about, and it was a problem of size and scale we'd never dealt with. The whole world was struggling with this disease. We had very little to learn from, and no one was coming to help. So I'm hoping... Okay. cases of COVID-19 outside China has increased. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. COVID-19 is spreading quickly across the country. This puts many people at risk of serious disease. Look them in the eyes and tell them you're doing all you can to stop the spread of COVID-19. And space. Jordan and Perry, and this is your coronavirus conundrum. Love you, Bob. Protect your loved ones, get the app. why we're doing everything we can, as quickly as we can, to protect your economic security. So that video is a little bit out of date and it's a little bit long, but I'm not going to apologise for that. I wanted to remind you, I suppose, of the unprecedented scale of the challenges that were presented by the pandemic and how we had to put in place a similarly unprecedented communications response to tackle it. 
And actually, uh, by the end of it, I think we've actually had 27 campaigns. Some of you can see them there on the screen. But this was genuinely the biggest peacetime communication challenge in living memory and possibly ever. We had to protect the NHS and save lives. We had to support businesses and the economy. We had to help society to function as normally as possible. And we had to secure vaccine uptake and the eventual end of the crisis. So how did we do that? Um, our job, my job, as a civil servant, is to provide advice to ministers. And we had to work out what to do. But how would we know what was the right thing to do? The stakes were high, our knowledge was patchy, and we realized we would need to draw on a really wide source of, uh, of data to help shape that advice. And so uh, on the 3rd of March 2020, I was asked to set up and lead the National Resilience Hub. I built a cross-disciplinary communications team with data, audience insight, and behavioral science fully integrated into how we worked. And our job was to run the biggest communication campaign in the history of government. In order to provide this advice, there was an immediate need and demand for insight and evaluation. The extraordinary pace of developments and the requirement for insight and evaluation meant we commissioned and conducted a large program of research. We began gathering all the data we could lay our hands on. And so we launched the most comprehensive program of qualitative and quantitative public research ever undertaken in government and drawing down data on a frequency and a scale never before undertaken. We were conducting uh, research and analysing it on a 24-hour cycle, working through the early hours every morning to crunch the data to put it into an easy-to-understand dashboard we could present to the Prime Minister, senior ministers and decision-makers every morning at 7am to help inform and shape the discussions that day. What that's done is that's led us to build one of the richest sources of audience understanding and campaign effectiveness that's ever been collected by government. We realised we needed to be able to better predict how the pandemic would develop and how people were responding. So working with the ONS and industry partners using ethically sourced and anonymised data, we began building a real-time dashboard using the widest range of data sets. So, for example, we knew, roughly speaking, COVID worked in like a two-week gestational cycle from infection to if you would need hospitalisation to if you would need to use a ventilated bed and, sadly, to deaths. So we started gathering wastewater samples and tested for how many people had COVID in local areas, even if they didn't know they'd had it and if they hadn't reported it. So we could start modelling what we would need for hospital bed capacity in that area or to assess whether we would need to impose local restrictions. We looked at online shopping activity, mobility data, school attendance and many other sources, all of which enabled us to build a picture in how people were responding in real time and what we should do to help uh, keep providing information to help uh, keep people safe. So as I said, we put all of this data into a clear dashboard that was used by the Prime Minister and Ministers as well as across government. Uh, when lockdown uh, occurred, we built a virtual press conference system and we held daily TV briefings where journalists could ask questions. And at these, at these we shared our data with the public and you can see uh, the dash, one of the one of the graphs there that we put out on a daily basis uh, and got used by all of our TV and media briefings. Uh, throughout this period, the UK government became the second most viewed publisher behind the BBC News, all of which was achieved by live streaming this press conference via Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube. And this also obviously provided free airtime to push out important public messaging. We were all used to journalists asking questions of ministers, but we knew that the public had many questions about what was going on. So we launched Ask.com, which was an online system that allowed the public to ask questions themselves. And the response was amazing. The very first question we got was from a grandmother from Skipton called Lynn. And her question to the Prime Minister is, when can I hug my grandchildren? Her question resonated with the British public because it was human and it was what everyone wanted to know. She became a bit of a local celebrity. But actually, out of this, I got another new, really rich data set. On that first day when we launched Ask.com, we had 65,000 questions from the public. It was a really rich data set that we were able to analyse to see what people were interested in, what questions they were asking, where was the information gap, we could cut this data by region, by nation, and really localise it, which meant we could respond and push out targeted communications to address those. 
So, for example, if the people in the northeast of England were most interested around the changes to rules around travel, we could geo-target our travel campaign and messaging there. We could work with local partners there, and we could amplify messaging there that people were actively seeking. And we added this to the other sources of data and developed a really comprehensive audience insight and segmentation which we used to shape and inform all our communication campaigns. We could see and understand what the public were thinking, feeling and doing, and we were able to develop communication campaigns in response to that. As you can imagine, with a comms program of this size, scale, speed and spend, we obviously had a very huge evaluation program to go alongside it. And what you can see on the screen there is the evaluation program that we put in place. And this is what we used on a continual iterative cycle to improve our communications. So we planned for success by joining together the research that other, all government departments did for policy and communication teams across government. And we used those consistent approaches to setting objectives and KPIs for each campaign, enabling us to measure and compare performance. We commissioned a really wide range of research to measure public and business attitudes and behaviours, sometimes um, at less than 24 hours notice, and used this research to inform uh, decision making across government. We had an iterative approach to evaluation. We began with rapid analysis, reporting trends on single data sets, but then we began to synthesize that research uh, with other data sets, both internal and external research. And we looked at digital responses, social media analytics, etc., to provide a more sophisticated analysis that looked at the factors that were driving public behavior and how communication could be most effective at changing and sustaining new behaviours as this pandemic rapidly evolved. Our systematic approach to collecting data and evaluation allowed us to then start modelling behaviour and ultimately calculate the number of lives saved due to the campaign. We regularly reported these uh, results and recommendations across government, breaking all of the rules we'd previously set for ourselves in the past by sharing research far and wide with other governments and other nations, providing short, sharp reports that focused on headline results, recommendations about how we could use them, as well as automated dashboards and tailor depth reports. Each week, we published our five things report, which was plain English, the five things we learned this week, and the five things we were going to do differently next week as a result. So very rapid learning and iteration. And what that led to is a really uh, fertile online and offline innovation communications program. And you can see here uh, a number of uh, UK government firsts working with partners across the industry, such as first advertisers to use city-based targeting on TikTok, uh, advertising on Nextdoor so we could get really super local. Uh, we built a WhatsApp bot and uh, we also did a, cha a Google chatbot. But it was a real environment for kind of innovation and learning, and because we could see if it worked, you could carry on doing the things that did, and you stopped doing the things that didn't. But I wanted to just talk a wee bit about vaccine communications uh, and a case study on how we used some of this data. So 90-year-old Margaret Keenan made headlines across the nation and globally for becoming the first person in the world to receive an approved COVID-19 jab as part of the mass vaccination programme. Now, the first COVID-19 vaccine was developed, approved and rolled out in the UK less than one year after the virus was first identified by the World Health Organization. It really quickly became a beacon of hope arising from the pandemic and one which would influence people's perception of government and its handling of the pandemic. But if you think back to November 2019, the majority of the UK public were hesitant or resistant to the idea of getting the vaccine. It seemed as though the biggest barrier was going to be public attitudes. And that's completely understandable because we're used to vaccines taking years and years to develop rather than to be produced in a matter of months. There were safety concerns around the potential side effects and the ingredients of the vaccine came up over and over from those people who said they weren't sure they were going to do it. And so the challenge for comms became clear. We used the amount of uh, insight we had to shape what we would do, as I hope you would expect us to. Um, and in the age of social media, where people can be exposed to a wide range of information and misinformation, delivering and communicating the efficacy of a vaccination programme proved obviously to be a challenge. 
We could have taken many different approaches as to how we could increase vaccine uptake, be that encouragement, persuasion, or guilt tripping. A route we actively chose not to go to was myth-busting the anti-vaxxers in government communications. We knew that although anti-vaxxers had a rising prominence, they were, still a vo they were just a vocal minority in the UK. And if people came across conspiracy theories around the COVID vaccine, or vaccines in general, it wouldn't come from government trying to dispute them. So, obviously, research shows that statements that are memorable and familiar-sounding are more readily believed to be true. So shining a light on anti-vaxxers and myth-busting them would draw unnecessary attention and amplify their arguments. Instead, what we did is we looked at how we might best target our, and segment our audience. So we decided not to tailor, uh, not to segment by arbitrary measures such as gender or race, but instead we divided the public into groups dependent on their attitudes towards getting the vaccine, which enabled us to develop tailored communications for each group. We didn't target the anti-vaxxers or those people who rejected the vaccine at all. Instead, we, our insight showed trying to persuade the unpersuadable would cause an unnecessary backlash and a pushback from these groups. Instead, our strategy was to work with the vast majority of people, those people who were much more likely to do it. We did research into what the motivations and barriers were to people getting vaccinated, and on both, both sides, they were really personal. People's motivation was to get back to normal life and to protect their loved ones, whereas their barriers were around safety concerns and the impact it could have on their bodies. So pressurizing them using external factors would not work. So we didn't do guilt tripping because we knew that they, weren't, they wouldn't be motivated to take the action by asking them to take their civic duty to take a, a, a vaccine, as these social obligations would not resonate with this group and could actively increase resistance. Instead, people feel having a vaccine is something they should decide for themselves. So messaging needed to be reassuring, encouraging, and dampen any fears people had around safety, which we knew was the biggest barrier. And the result of that is this uh, intensive communications program that those of you who are in the UK may have seen. Communications built upon data, insight, and creativity, using a wide range of A-B testing, iterating at both speed and with accuracy, retiring those things that didn't work, and further segmenting and creating new things that did work. And it worked. So um, in November 2019, the majority of the population were hesitant or resistant to getting a vaccine. And the communication program developed uh, that was developed with speed and accuracy, it was done in a very small window, helped facilitate a real seismic ship shift in attitudes towards vaccination. And to the extent that now over 92% of people aged 12 or above in the UK have received at least one dose of the vaccine. And our modeling as a result of the communications activity showed that over 5.2 million people got vaccinated or boosted as a direct result of our communications. But things have changed and they are still changing. We now face a really wide variety of other challenges and issues that people are concerned about. Cost of living, backlog in the NHS, the economy, crime, the environment, and we now have another virus. So all other priorities that people need and want government to tackle. So government comms have been on an epic journey over the last couple of years, and we want to make sure that we learn from and embed all that we have learned through that really fast iteration and learning process of the last couple of years. And from this, Project Epic was born. It actually was our internal working title, but um, it stuck because it is epic. We've got over 30 waves of data, over 100,000 people spoken to so far, and continuing to grow. So in order to embed this, you can see on the screen what we've done so far. We've reviewed the data. We've cleansed our database. We've produced a compendium report and a big scrutiny document so we can go through all of the things we have learned through it. And then we are sharing these insights across government communications to change how we do our work going forward. Simply put, we want the learning process we've been on for the last couple of years to act as a catalyst to change in government communications, both what we do and how we do it. We've developed some principles that we can apply to all of our new communications. So as we move back towards the new normal, recognizing that we should segment people on a whole wide range of data sets, recognizing that some people are actively tuning out and they do not want to hear from government, 
but that if we use a really smart, segmented approach, we can cut through some of that checkout, that cynicism, and that cluster of news that people have. We've also learned when paid-for campaigns can be most effective and when actually a different form of communication would be more effective. And that means we can target our spend in the right ways um, and not be wasting public money. And then the other principle that we've learned is that communications is not going to change your mind. It's not going to change somebody's values or beliefs or attitude. And so communication works best when it works within people's pre-existing values and attitudes. And that's what will drive uh, change if that is what you want. Uh, in government, we do like a lovely list of bullet points, uh, and these are some of the things that we have learnt uh, through the last couple of years, which you can see here on the screen. But, you know, communications... In, in the olden days, communications and policy and strategy were kept quite separate. Actually, what we've now learned is that communications data can go into core data sets to help not just promote policy, but to shape policy and to drive it. And having that shared version of the truth that can help underpin your policy and comms development, there is real value in that. We've learned that you don't need to get it all right at the beginning. Having an iterative and an agile approach is, is a really good way to work. But make sure you've got consistent principles baked in from the very beginning. And make sure those principles for better communication are there right from the very beginning. There is a balance to be struck between speed and robustness of research. I mean, in the pandemic, we learned we could turn things around incredibly quickly. But also build on your evidence, build on your knowledge, and keep growing that. Collaborate, trust, share. I built a really good uh, trust with people in other governments, in other nations, because data is most valuable when we share it, when we discuss it, and when we action what we learn from it. Uh, use right evidence in the right way at the right time, but also know what to do with it. And that's involved having communicators right at the decision-making table, sitting around the table with the Prime Minister and providing communications advice, data and insight to help shape the responses we do. I think I've already touched enough on audience segmentation, but uh, learn that you cannot reach everybody. Uh, but actually, if you segment wisely, then you can reach as many people as possible. And uh, our gradual, gradual improvement, not overnight perfection. The pace we were working at, sometimes you just needed to get it out the door. But actually, evaluation is not an end of the project thing. We evaluated on a daily basis with our social assets. We worked out what worked, what didn't work, and we, we failed quickly, fail quickly, and then build on those things that work. Also learned to kind of keep being curious about your audience, keep being curious and building up more. And as I say, some people are actively tuning out, so work out new and innovative ways to, to, to reach them. Uh, I think we'll be, lots of people are talking about automated reporting, but actually what we learn is obviously you can have a huge amount of data, but without that human insight to bring it to life, it doesn't really go anywhere. And finally, obviously unifying measurement and evaluation takes time, but I believe that the payback is worth it. And one of the questions I'm constantly asked is, how do you know it worked? So uh, one of the models the team worked on is, could we prove how many lives had been saved as a result of our communications? And you'll see we actually had quite a tight window, and this was based on two campaigns, so we could be as clear as possible on the data. And we proved, our model proved that uh, we have prevented between 1.5 million and 1.8 infections and saved up to 27,000 lives, which for me is a very good reason to get out of bed in the morning. And then finally, we've baked this into all of our work going forward. So we've had the richest source of audience insight that we've ever had in government. And we've been able to use this wealth of data to analyze our work using econometrics to look at uh, a return on investment that we can share. We've baked this into all of our planning reporting across government, being really clear up front before you're even allowed to do any activity or spend a penny. What outcomes do you want to achieve? And how will you know that you've done it? And so finally, to the legacy of this work, um, using this wide and rich data set to inform and shape policy, strategy, and communications is now being baked into all of our crisis and resilience response in government. Uh, we are now setting up a really strong integrated data and analysis function that will exist in Cabinet Office to provide advice across all emerging crises and problems. And we are reiterating, repeating the response that we went through through COVID in how we respond to the Ukraine invasion and also the cost of living crisis. And it will come as no surprise to know that we have a five things coming out about what we've learned about Ukraine uh, invasion and the five things we're going to do differently as a result. 
And that is me. Thank you. Can I leave now? <laughs> so close. <laughs> Love a good ominous threat. Um, any questions for Claire? Then I will kick off with the first question. Monkeypox. No, I'm just. <laughs> um, I, know, I know a lot about monkeypox now. So. Obviously, you guys have a lot of data that yeah. goes into to this information, and you also had a new leadership change at the organization. How has that been embraced, the existing structure? Are you going through kind of data and evaluation changes there? And can you talk a little bit about what that's like, how that's impacted some of your benchmarking data, and what some of the challenges and some of the benefits of that are of having that new lens on the information? So obviously we now have, we have a new leader at the, end of, at the head of government communication service and he's been looking at how we might restructure ourselves to do things differently. And one of the things that we've learned is that we don't need to duplicate work and a part of our new model going forward is to have a centralised team that can genuinely deliver the things that other parts of government cannot do, be that because of economies of scale, the amount of budget, but also that point about sharing your data and sharing your insight. And so we've built and we've built on on what we've done as part of the COVID response to have an integrated core team of brilliant specialists who can take really brilliant specialist data but turn it into really clear English, plain, actionable insights, and then shared as widely as possible. And I think that approach to using this rich data set will be through all of government communications because we want to build on what we've learned, that audience insight. And also, this is public money we're spending, so you don't want to be spending it to no effect. We want it to actually drive the outcome that you want. Great, thank you so much. We have time for one more question for Claire, if anybody would like to take advantage of t asking a question, not of Claire. <laughs> James Crawford, yes. <laughs> Yeah, hold on a second, James. If you'll wait for the mic so the virtual team I have a mic now. people can hear you. Um, yeah, just a quick question about the behavioral science aspects of, of what you've done, because uh, there's a PR agency in the UK that's grown very quickly recently using behavioral science. It's, a, it's an area that we personally haven't done that much work in. So very broad question. Could you give an overview of that aspect? How, what sort of person or company are you going to to provide that? Or just a bit more information would be lovely. Yeah, so we have an in-house behavioural science team of some uh, highly qualified, brilliant, clever uh, uh, people of a range of different ages. I was about to say young people. So yeah, we have an in-house team of uh, behavioural scientists who we've worked with and we spread them across the whole of the project and we particularly use them to provide targeted advice around how we drive the right behaviours but also how we don't drive some of the other behaviours. We may all remember panic buying and petrol uh, and uh, how we try to use them to shape the comms messaging. So to be clear on what comms messaging will drive those behaviours and what comms messaging accidentally might drive those perverse behaviours you don't want. Turned out it was a tweet from, a tweet from someone in an oil company saying, no, there's no problem and off it all went. Uh, we also use them to provide really simple guidance and advice that we could give to our partners, so with all of the local authorities across the country, so to help them to do their targeted communications really uh, cleverly and smartly. And then finally, we also used and we red teamed any time we were going to do a change. We did a red team challenge. We brought people from outside. We brought people from different disciplines. Um, and we always made sure we had one of the behavioral science on there to kind of call us out and to say, you might be driving that perverse behavior that you're not seeking. Great. Thanks so much. And we will allow one last question from an Irish stakeholder. Hello. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Jonna. Paul Quigley from Newswhip. Um, I've been really impressed over the years with, you know, when you come to events like this and you see um, UK government speakers and, and public entity speakers, it's incredible, uh, the quality of measurement and evaluation work. But also we've seen as a provider the tech adoption um, across governments really, across different DCMS to cabinet office, like things spread quickly. Mm. And uh, I haven't seen that in other government entities and uh, around the world. Is that because of secondments between departments? Do you think UK government departments are particularly good at sharing information and best practices with each other? Is that, what is the internal story or the culture that's going on inside to drive this 
uh, this quality of both tech adoption and best practices across departments? Well, speaking personally from the very beginning, having uh, parents who live in Scotland and family who live in Wales and uh, having travelled to Northern Ireland a lot, I decided you know, this was a citizen uh, facing virus and it didn't really care where there was a border. And so uh, I set up very quickly a, a team with the, my counterparts in the devolved administrations where we get together for at least an hour once a week and we still do it to this day because we decided we would share best practice, we would share learning, we would share challenges and actually they've become a cohort of, you know, friendly colleagues who give me challenge and support. It's meant we've been able to do things that we might not have done before because we built that trust and decided at the very beginning this was what we wanted to do. I also think we like, when we learn something, we want to talk about it, we want to share it, we want more people to do it because, you know, a learning opportunity of this scale and intensity where actually you had the opportunity because you had to do stuff to try things really quickly that we talk about it and we share and we've learned to fail quickly and really build on those things that work and um, we're a community that likes to kind of talk and share but that's kind of why we're all here as well right <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, Claire. And special round of applause for Claire and a special tomorrow is Claire's birthday. So. <laughs> thank you.